Hey gang, welcome back for another video here on Joe Chem. Okay gang, so we're gonna, you know, take a break from parole and furan and thiophene. We've been spending a lot of time together. You know, it's, it's been good, it's been great, but enough's enough, we need to move on. And what will replace them in our hearts is pyridine. I'm not gonna lie to you gang, this, this one's gonna be a bit of a doozy. And it's just because there's gonna be a mechanism, it's gonna be a little long, but the best part is, if there's a silver lining, is that you already know everything we're about to do. We're just gonna be stringing together quite a bit of stuff to do something brand new. But before we get to that, I just wanna introduce pyridine. Now, I'm sure you've seen pyridine before, but now it's kind of the uh, formal introduction. So, pyridine, obviously it's a heterocycle, because clearly we see carbon and nitrogen, more than two atoms in the ring, yada, 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 you know the heterocycle spiel by now. And obviously it's aromatic, right? If I'm gonna do my, draw my side view of this wonderful pyridine, not the best artist's rendition, but one nonetheless. Uh, let me make sure I draw these double bonds in the right place. Okay, cool. So obviously we have a p orbital here, p orbital here, p orbital there, p orbital here, p orbital here. And you can see nitrogen is part of a double bond. So it is sp2 hybridized, it straight up has a p orbital to go. So this extra lone pair that's chilling, right, since it's sp2 hybridized, that lone pair is gonna reside in its own wonderful sp2 orbital, hybrid orbital, and it's gonna be perpendicular to all of the p orbital action going on. And you know, so we check all the boxes. It's a ring, everyone's sp2, we have a series of you know parallel p orbitals, and two, four, six, these are the, the double bonds, the only active uh, electrons in the delocalized pi system. So, you know, four n plus two equals six, n equals one, we're good at math. It is aromatic, okay? So, introduction over. Now, let's move on to the fun stuff. We're gonna talk about a reaction called the Hange pyridine synthesis. Probably botched the pronunciation, but nonetheless, we're going to just dive right into it. The one crazy thing is that we're gonna need quite a bit of molecules to make this happen. So the mechanism I'm gonna show you, the things on our grocery list, uh, we're gonna need one ammonia, we're gonna need one aldehyde, and the aldehyde I'm gonna pick is just a super simple one. I'm just gonna pick formaldehyde, just a one carbon aldehyde. Formaldehyde, spelling this large part. Hopefully I didn't misspell it, formaldehyde, I think that's right. Okay, and then the other thing is that we're gonna need two beta dicarbonyls. And the ones I'm going to pick, pretty simple, but it's just gonna be of like a two carbon ester piece. And then, so you can see that we're gonna need two of these, right? So it's almost like a, we're gonna need two of them. But uh, yeah, we're gonna need, you know, the beta dicarbonyl thing going on. So you'll see, again, you, you already know the sum of all the individual pieces of this mechanism. Stringing it together is kind of a lot. I don't know if this is the type of thing that a teacher would require you to know, the mechanism wise, but I'm gonna provide it in case you need to know it. And then once we do it, I have two complete the reaction questions. So much like the Robinson annulation, what we'll do is we'll go through the whole dang thing and then I'll kinda, you know, we'll get a strategy going for, for the quick and dirty, right? Completing the reaction because clearly you might not have the time to, you know, draw out the full mechanism, okay? So let me clean this up and we'll dive right on in. Hey gang, all right, so as we dive into this longer mechanism, the way I kind of want to chunk it up is the way I envision this, the Hange pyridine synthesis is kind of three steps. So I just want to do a step, you know, fully explain it, <clears throat> then I want to erase it because I'm going to need lots of space. Then we'll move on to the next step and then the next step and then before you know it, we'll be done. But in this first step, we're gonna be kind of doing like two sub steps. In step one that I envision personally, all we're doing is we're preparing, we're gonna be preparing two kind of different pieces that will eventually become, like will help form the six membered ring. So you see we have four things going on. Basically we're gonna be using the buddy system and two, two pieces will be pro undergoing an aldol condensation and then two pieces will be undergoing an imine formation, and I'm gonna put a little asterisk here because it is imine formation with just the tiniest little extra step at the end. It's nothing earth shattering, but you'll see what I mean. Okay, 
So for 1A, we're doing an aldol condensation. And I know I mentioned that you need beta dicarbonyls for this reaction. You really only need maybe one. And the reason being is that you just need, you want to pick something where you know you're going to have a predictable, uh, you're going to create a predictable enolate. Uh, in this case, this is going to be an ester enolate, right? Because right here, clearly if we're working with one of these two, I'm going to take my structure, my dicarbonyl right here. And if I'm going to undergo alpha deprotonation, create an enolate, the no-brainer is that my most acidic proton available is at this position because it's in between the carbonyls, right? So if this were to get picked off, a little a negative charge be placed on this carbon, we have two routes of resonance versus this alpha carbon right there. So what I'm going to do is, you know, I don't know, let's just say we have OH minus. Create your ester enolate. Okay, so we're doing an aldol condensation, right? So what are we working with? Well, if you look up top, the only carbonyl we should be attacking is this aldehyde right here. You take, you basically take one of the things that you're gonna, you know, you're gonna get your, your, uh, your the ester enolate you're confident in that you know where it's going to enolize, then you throw in the aldehyde or, you know, the carbonyl that you have thrown into the mix, which is this one carbon aldehyde right here. Electrons swing down, we're using our knowledge of carbonyl chemistry right here. So I reformed my carbonyl, and what I'm doing is I bonded from this carbon right here, and I've attached to on just this one extra carbon. So that's my dot carbon. I'll draw one line to my asterisk carbon, and off of that asterisk carbon, I have an O minus, and then there's an H right there. Okay, and just to save myself a little bit of space, you can just assume you know there's water <clears throat> and hydroxide right here. So this can this will end up as an OH. Remember, since we're driving to the condensation, we can crank up the heat. Remember, that helps us basically drive off OH, not a superb leaving group, but given enough heat, it can be a leaving group nonetheless. So we get a condensation product for what we are, what we are calling, what we are terming, or what I'm terming, step 1A, okay? So you want to produce a beta unsaturated carbonyl. Remember what that means, right? You have your carbonyl and then at the beta position, right? You have the start of a, uh, a double bond. Or if you want to use some, some slang, right? We just produced an enone, okay? That's important. We're going to need that for the cyclization. Okay, so that was step 1A. Let's look at 1B. So this is imine formation with a slight twist, all right? So this one, much more, I guess, you know, we're imine pros, right? We're also out of condensation pros, right? So we're going to be grabbing our amine, the primary amine or ammonia that we have thrown in the mix. And the other, you know, carbonyl we have available is another one of the beta dicarbonyls. So right off the bat, remember, ketones are more reactive than esters, so we're going to be doing imine formation at the ketone. So I'm just going to assume right off the bat that I've protonated my carbonyl oxygen, right? We need to do that to make it more reactive. Ammonia comes in, we attack, forming a tetrahedral intermediate. Right, okay. So, I have an OH up here. I have an NH3, so plus charge on nitrogen. Okay, remember, we need to play the game of who do I want to stay, who do I want to leave? We want nitrogen to stick around, we want this OH to peace out. So let's grab some Hydronium to protonate up the OH to our good friend water. And then let's grab water to help ammonia stick around, get rid of that positive charge. So we got, we have a water ready to leave. We now have a neutral nitrogen. So remember, we want to drive off water. We will drive off water. What's going to facilitate that is... Uh, let, me, let me move this positive charge. Getting a little crowded. Positive charge down here. Water will leave because these electrons will swing down before we double bond. Use some space down here. Remember, this should all be old hat. And if not, 
feel free to check out that uh, immune formation video in the Carbonyl series on Joe Kelly. Okay, so we have this right here. Here is the slight twist. Instead of just doing a simple deprotonation and then going, we actually will do something called immune tautomerization. So you don't just get an immune off the bat, which is this. We're actually going to, water is going to pick this off. And we actually do kind of like enamine formation. You're gonna see why this is important right off the, why we need this type of confirmation, okay? So it's these two things we are carrying into the next step. So the very first step, rather, is that we have this enone that we're carrying forward, and we are forming an imine, but then switching it to the enamine conformation, okay? So, oop, got it. It's that we need these two, and you're going to see once I pause the video, do a cleanup, and I draw these two in the proper formation, but what is going to happen is because we have, you know, these electrons available for our alpha carbon right here. I'm using alpha carbon in terms of, um, you know, this right here being a carbonyl. This is a soft nucleophile. And given soft nucleophiles when paired with, you know, beta unsaturated carbonyls, enones, right? Remember, we do one for additions. So this will lay the foundation for something like this to happen. An attack from here that will hit this, and that's going to help us start to cyclize. That helps us connect, you know, in a chain fashion, and then we can close the loop by, we attack from here on the enone, and then the nitrogen can attack the carbonyl carbon, and that's, gonna, that's what's gonna stick our ring together, okay? So let me clean this up, okay? And you'll see these two, once again, but in a different conformation. Okay, gang, we got a bunch of momentum coming up from smashing step one, you know, A and B. Let's roll right into step two, like the freight train we are. Okay, so I erased everything and I basically just put over here what we produced from our first step. So, cyclization. Like I said, the next thing we're going to do is from this alpha carbon right here, we are going to do a 1 4 addition over here, right? 1 4 addition if I label 1, 2, three and four, right, that system. And that's gonna be the beginning of our cyclization. Let's draw it a little, I like to draw it in a way that makes a little bit more sense to me, like a, like lining up almost like a deals alder type deal. So what I like to do is, I'm going to draw, I hope this makes sense. So let me, and, give myself a little bit more space. And maybe you don't like this, but I, I think it makes a little sense when we give myself a little more space. NH2, ester. So at this point, the esters are really just for decoration. The reason why the esters were helpful is because it gave us predictable enol, uh, enolization, you know, when we, well, at least for the, the aldol condensation piece of it. Okay, cool, so this is what we got. So like I said, this carbon right here is going to attack right here because of the fact that we have a soft nucleophile, soft nucleophiles do one, four additions with enones, right? So what's gonna happen is these electrons on the nitrogen swing down, the electrons in this double bond go over here. We're gonna have a very cyclical thing going on. We need to avoid breaking the octet rule at this position, so we bounce these right here. Whoop. And then last but not least, we will bounce these favorably up onto oxygen right there. So really it's just a ring around the rosy, but the start of the show being that we are making a bond right there, okay? So let's draw the result of this. It's gonna be quite the spaghetti monster. And I'm gonna actually draw myself some barriers here so I don't jump into stuff. Okay, so I'm gonna just kinda of draw a lot of things that I didn't touch. So I have this ester up here. I'm gonna kinda of draw this piece first. So I know I have this going on, and that was a dotted carbon. I no longer have a double bond here, I have a double bond here. And I still have this methyl group and I still have this oxygen, but it has a negative charge, okay? So now I have a double bond from here to, to that other carbon that I have dotted, okay? I still have the ester up here, 
just for show. Nothing, nothing functional there. Uh, I no longer have a double bond here. I still have a methyl group over here. And I have a double bond here with this nitrogen. This nitrogen has two hydrogens. And since it took a lone pair, made it a double bond, it has a positive charge. Okay, so this step, what I like to call this step, and I'm going to draw my arrow here, draw something here, and then kind of loop back down here. This step is purely just going to be some prep for, so we've connected up top. I think you can start to see this ring forming up top. We need to close the ring down here. So this step is purely just some tautomerization, right? We're going to do the same thing we did with the imine in the last step of our imine formation, and we're also going to, so you can see we've made an enolate. We need to flip that enolate back to a carbonyl, and we need to make this, uh, we need to clean up this imine as well, okay? So what we're going to do is, like I said, much like we're going to tautomerize both. So we need to make a double bond here and give these electrons back to the nitrogen. So there's an H here. I'm going to drop very obviously. So water is going to help us out. Grab the H, electrons swing down, give them back to nitrogen. And then at the same time, right, we need to flip this enolate back to a ketone. So what we can do is we can swing these down, form our carbonyl carbon, then, you know, oxygen double bond. These electrons need to find a home. We can use hydronium to get that done. There we go, right? So result of that is... Didn't touch the esters at all. All that changed on this side is double bond is gone. We have a carbonyl. Instead, didn't touch the ester at all. Didn't touch that methyl group at all. I have a double bond here. And now I have N with two H's and a lone pair. Okay? So, the annoying part is before we attack this carbonyl, oxygen right here, because we're basically going to be doing some type of like imine formation, the, the start of it. Need to protonate it, need to activate it. So I'm going to grab my hydronium. So it's just a plus H plus step. Don't have to write it, just being explicit. So now I'm going to move over here. I'm going to use as much of the room I have available as possible. Have a protonated carbonyl oxygen. I have this amine ready to roll. Didn't touch this ester whatsoever. So now you can see what we're going to do is this, I'm going to move these up here. We're going to finally close our ring. This nitrogen is going to attack the carbonyl carbon. We bounce these electrons over to oxygen. You can tell this is very annoying to redraw over and over and over again. If you want to save yourself some grief, you can also abbreviate those esters further. Um, So we have this OH. This carbon is now bonded to nitrogen, which has a plus charge. So you can see, oh, did I? One, two, three, wait, one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, yeah. I was like, this looks short. It's because I'm drawing my bonds weird. There we go. So we have a hexagon. That's great. Okay? You can see we are so, 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 so close to what we're supposed to have, right? And I'm going to just keep rolling. What I like to think is step three, because we've kind of done the cyclization. Step three is just the dehydration. So what you can see is all we need is this double bond right there, right? We have the one over here. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to have water, do some cleanup here on the amine, but I'm also going to protonate this OH up to water. We need to prime to be a good leaving group because we don't see an OH in our final product. So a classic plus H plus minus H plus step, right? We're deprotonating what, deprotonating what we want to stay, protonating what we want to leave, okay? And then in a final blaze of glory, OH2 plus methyl group, methyl group, ester, Esther, and I did not forget the double bond, don't worry. Okay, 
what do we have to do? We need a double bond here. Look at the carbon next door. I'm going to expose this H. I'm going to bring water in or whatever you have available. Grab that. I'm going to use black to show this forming and we drive off water in our lovely dehydration. And I'm going to draw the final product over here. And that, ladies and germs, is how you get to, it's not pyridine. I'll show you this me mechanistically, this is as far as we'll go. But this is how you get to what is so close to pyridine. And whew, you now know how to mechanistically show the haunch pyridine synthesis. So conceptually, you all knew how to do this stuff with maybe the just the slight exception of the imine tautomerization. I feel like that may, has, may have come up if your professor was partial to it when you learned about imines, but it comes up now, so you just have to almost remember where it happened. But anything else, you already knew how to do. It was just stringing it all together. Annoyingly, this is one of those things where it's a long procedure, so I think if you just practice it, you'll get good at it. Um, but it's nothing over the moon, right? Nothing over the top. So now that you know mechanistically how to do this, what I want to do is carry this forward to show you how you actually get to like the, arom the aromatic pyridine derivative. And then what I want to do is two complete the reaction questions because we ain't got time for this. Not on exams, you know, not when you're in a time crunch, not when there are TikTok videos to watch. So I'll show you, you know, given some reactants, how do you predict the product? And then given the product, how do you deduce the reactants? So thanks for holding on. And it's a longer video. I appreciate you. Let me clean this up. We kind of got two more segments left. So let's waste no time and get through it. Okay, gang, now that we've mechanistically, you know, gone through the rite of passage and gotten to the point where we can produce this intermediate in the Hodge pyridine synthesis, I wanted to show you the two extra steps, no mechanism needed, to get to pyridine or pyridine derivative, okay? So, to actually get to the air, you know, get to a place where you have aromaticity in the ring, you just need to have this oxidative conditions, this acidic oxidative conditions, and that doesn't touch anything in your ring, that actual, okay, it does, the nitrogen, but it doesn't touch any substituents of the ring. So if you have an ester, if you have these methyl groups, if you have anything else untouched, and you actually just get the aromatic you know, character of purity, which is great, right? Now, for example, these esters are decorative. You could stop right here, but for example, if you wanted to get to something that looked more like pyridine. Keep doing that. <laughs> okay, something like this, right? What we can do is basically decarboxylations. If you toss in some calcium carbonate, if you toss in some NaOH, some basic conditions plus heat. Because remember, these esters, they're decorative now, but the purpose, you know, at least one of them served was in our, um, these are circled for a reason. Uh, in our aldol condensation, remember, we, uh, we needed to predict, we needed a, a position we knew we would predictably create an enolate at. So that was great back then, not really doing anything functional for us now. So if you do some calcium carbonate in this, you know, this, these basic conditions, you basically unwind these esters through basic condition ester hydrolysis, and then the calcium carbonate and the heat help facilitate the driving off of CO2. So you end up with nothing at these positions, you just have some hydrogens and that's it. So, uh, the reason why those are circled, I hope you can see, even in here, and here as well, you can see that these methyl groups right here, especially with these esters present, clearly you can just see the outline of this. We're just missing the carbonyl at this, uh, at this position, right, on both sides. And we know that that was a result of, you know, the cyclization, the amyl condensation, but I hope you can see that the nitrogen is just represented just here, right? It came in with three things, and it has none of them, right? It's just a nitrogen. And you can, I hope you can see that the, the outline of carbons right here are all represented across this chain. Same thing right here. But where does this carbon come from? Well, that carbon, the linking point, is gonna be whatever aldehyde you threw in. So that's gonna be a carbon that was initially a carbonyl when you first start your haunch pyridine synthesis. The reason why I'm highlighting this 
is when we do the two problems to come, you know, I'm gonna have one where we start with the end pro product and then we deduce the reactants and then we're gonna have one where we have the reactants and we, do, we predict the products. And knowing kind of what is represented where in the ring will help us, you know, go from the end to the beginning or the beginning to the end. So let me erase this and we will figure out how to do that. Okay gang, let's go through these two examples and then come out the other side knowing that we are pros at the Hodge pyridine synthesis. Okay, so let's start up top. So we're gonna go from a pyridine product to what we tossed in and mixed together to get there. Okay, so one thing I hope we can see right off the bat is clearly we did it, we, we did the oxidative you know, workup under acidic conditions. We had the aromaticity, but we do we did not do any calcium carbonate you know, decarboxylation stuff under base because we still have like an ester up there. Okay, so the way I like to do this, the very first thing I like to do is clearly you know you're gonna have ammonia in the mix, that's just a requirement for the Hodge pyridine synthesis. Okay, the next thing I like to do is I look at this carbon opposite the nitrogen because you know that was the aldehyde involved in the aldol condensation. It's so easy to just go right off the bat and just say, okay, whatever R group I had up there, you know, this one is just looks scary. It's just this. You know that's the aldehyde right off the bat. At that point, you've basically done this. It's these pieces now, I'm gonna kind of, it's this, I'm gonna draw this air a little bit better. You just know that you need to represent this and this, the two carbons in the ring and then whatever's off of them. So I know that this was an ester and I had the one carbon that is in the ring so I can dot it just to show you, it's this one right here. The next carbon that was attached to must have been a carbonyl because you know you can tell that you know there was a connection here. We saw that that was part of how the ring closed with the nitrogen attacking the carbonyl carbon. And I just off of here, if I asterisk it, you can see it right here. And there's just a methyl group off of it. And then, so that's one, and then this piece right here. So remember, if this carbon right here that I'm asterisking was part of the imine formation, right? So if I have this methyl being this carbon right here, this asterisk must have been a carbonyl. And then I have the other carbon that's in the ring, I can dot it right here. And then I actually just have a nitrile to finish it off. So really, I think these problems are pretty simple. Once you've done the work and like seen how the mechanism goes, I think the easiest thing is just knowing, okay, ammonia, here's my aldehyde. And then you just pick off whatever those are. It's, I don't wanna say it's easy, but there's, there's a procedure, which is why it's easy, right? It's a reliable, reproducible procedure, okay? So let's look at the bottom. Now let's, let's see how we can predict a product given uh, the pieces for a Hodge period synthesis. Okay, so what do we have going on? So okay, so we even have after, so clearly if we're gonna have anything, I hope you can see we have some esters going on right here. So we're basically going to have to predict this product after the decarboxylations, but I still think we should predict the product as it exists like this, and then we can easily wipe away the esters. So what I think is super nice is you know this is going to look like this. You have a template, you have a ring that you, you, you just have to fill in the pieces, okay? So remember, we basically, by doing this, we have figured out where the ammonia goes. Now, again, I like to go straight to the aldehyde, this dot I just put on that carbon is the carbonyl carbon. So to, to correctly place that, we just need to add the methyl group right here, just acetaldehyde, okay? So now remember, these two carbons right here, they are involved, they were, they were involved in both the aldol condensation and the amine formation. So whatever pieces you're working with, that is the regular carbonyl, whether it be an aldehyde or a ketone, not your ester. So identify that and then, okay, my R group off of there is just an ethyl group. So I have an ethyl group and I have an ethyl group, okay? Oh, there we go. So then here, you just have to, so we know that the asterisk is this right here. We know this carbon is represented in the ring at these positions. 
And then you just have this ester right here on both sides. I'm going to abbreviate OET. The nice part is, okay, well, now we predicted the product. Okay, we're gonna do a decarboxylation. Bam. So I like these problems because I feel like once you've, especially if, you've under, if you understand you know, the mechanism under the hood, there's a procedure for predicting the product. So it's a difficult concept, I think, but it's really easy to, on a test, right? Something that you, that you initially, when you learn it, expect it to be so long and requ require a lot of analysis. There's a, there's a reliable shortcut way to predict the product correctly. Okay, gang. So this I feel like is really, really, really cool because it involves so much different parts of chemistry, right? It's acid base heavy, there's tautomerization, there's imine formation, there's auto condensation, right? There's decarboxylation, right? It involves aromaticity. It really is just the whole kitchen sink at you in one reaction, which is kind of cool. And it happens in nature, which is rad, right? Okay, thank you for tuning in. I hope after this, you don't think that the Hodge period synthesis is scary. I hope you think it's kind of cool when that, you know, in actuality, it's not that hard and it's kind of badass if you, you know, have it down on lock. So uh, thank you for tuning in. Make sure to like and subscribe and I'll see you all in the next video.